Your job was to make the sound. Yes. It? Well, yes, I, I did make a sound in actual fact because, well, right from the very start, their sound wasn't very good because their equipment wasn't terribly good. But what I wanted to do, there was something different about this group, guitar group, than I'd seen before with any other guitar groups. Just something different. And uh, what I wanted to do, therefore, was there was such a personality about them that I recognised straight away. I don't think, I don't, funny enough, I don't think George Martin did initially, but I, I did. Uh, this personality uh, came through to me strongly. So what I wanted to do was to try to capture a sound whereby they were actually performing for you in your room when you listened. And the, the sound, like for instance, if you went to a theater at any time in, to see a band or whatever, you would get a mixture of the direct sound from the stage and also from the acoustics of the, the theater that you, you were in. This is what I tried. To, I wanted to try and get to, because this would add to the, the live, you know, the, and I hoped the the personality of this band. So what I did, I would start them off by letting them play their what levels they were comfortable at. First of all, setting them all up so that they were close together uh, and they were happy with they could hear one another, you know, and uh, play off one another. I knew how important this was because I was a jazz musician and had my own uh, quintet myself and I knew how important it was for us to be close together. So this I wanted to get with the boys. So I set them up to start with as though they were performing on stage. Then I said, set your own levels when they're on the run through that you're happy with. So this they did and they were, they were happy with it. And then what I would do then, I wanted to to get the, the, the ambience of the room of number two studio as well. And that came about by me positioning the microphones sometimes as much as 20 or 30 feet away from an amplifier in order to get this. And that was strictly against the, the EMI rules. Uh, the company policy was that set down by the two uh, major uh, senior uh, sound engineers and when I first became a sound engineer I was told by the management you must adhere to the rules that they've laid down which was an awful lot of screens uh, and uh, close microphoning uh, 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 positioning and that sort of thing but then as I said to you now uh, once I got developed uh, as and recognized as a sound engineer I thought well to hell with the rules I'm going to do it my way which is exactly what I did. And fortunately, people have noticed it, that, that sound, that live sound, and, and that's how I got it, by positioning the microphones in a certain way so that I got a mixture of direct and off the walls, the ambience. And, and that, I think, did, well, I think so, contribute to, you know, the, the, the personality that I was after. And that's how I got the sound. And it was a personality particular to them. Yes. Oh, yes. The only time I ever did it was with, with them. I, I did several other groups uh, of, from, from uh, Liverpool as well. Uh, but I didn't mic them up in, in the same way. These guys, to me, were special uh, right from the very time I met them. And their personality came, well, hit me, you know. Uh, Took George a little time to get used to it because yeah, George Martin, anyway, he wasn't used to that that kind of uh, uh, rock group, call it that. Anyway, as you you may know, the type of records that he made. I'm very good at it, of course, at that. But uh, he wasn't that interested in in guitar groups, you know, playing that. I can understand he, 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 his lack of enthusiasm to begin with, as I've said, because they they didn't show anything. Uh, at the audition, but it, of course, then wasn't long before it particularly, I mean, Love Me Do was not a great hit. We had a bit of a struggle. George didn't actually come to the first recording of uh, Love Me Do. His assistant came, and uh, Ron, Ron Richards, and myself. So we were left to 
Love Me Do, the first record. It wasn't terribly successful, no, not because of our fault, but because uh, it just wasn't happening, you know, and particularly Ron thought, and later George, because of Pete Best, uh, his drumming, which I never agreed to, actually. It wasn't what Pete uh, would, was playing. It, 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 it was, um, or, or rather, it wasn't uh, because of his drumming. It was because of what he, he was playing in the head arrangement, which I thought was all wrong. But, um, you know, uh, George and Ron got together later. Well, we had to abandon that first session and um, they decided that uh, Pete had got to go, which of course he did. And uh, mind you, I think the, the other three lads, in any case, they had their eye on Ringo by that time. Uh, he was playing in another Liverpudlian group. And uh, funny enough, I think the Hurricanes, I think it was. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, but I did think in actual fact that it was Epi, Epstein, Brian Epstein, that actually uh, it was his doing that got uh, Pete Best out. But I, I was wrong. It was because of, uh, well, um, Ron and George thinking that Pete Best wasn't good enough uh, for the group, so he had to go. But I still say it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that. It was the. It wasn't a very. It wasn't a decent arrangement. He was a decent enough drummer. It, it, it wasn't that at all. This is solely my opinion. That um, you know, uh, it was mainly down to what he was playing and not how he was playing. Tell me what it was like to hear. Please please me when you recorded it. I mean, what, hearing it today, it's as live as it ever. I mean, it's it's a thrilling record. Tell me anything you remember about Please Please Me. Well, I mean, for the first time I heard it, here was the kind of stuff I was hoping to get from this group. The personality of the song itself came across to what I was feeling, you know, and especially after trouble we'd had with Love Me Do anyway. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it was just uh, difficult to describe, really, except that, uh, ah, this has got to be it. This is the song, you know, that uh, uh, it should make it. Because still we had uh, no idea that it was going to be a, a big hit, you know, obviously. But as um, soon as I finished it, funny enough, because uh, you pop, I don't know if I should tell you this, but the Decca, had turned them down. Every, every, all the other uh, major companies had turned them down. And as soon as we finished uh, uh, Please Please Me, there was, I won't name him, but it was somebody at EMI, a cutter at EMI, and I said to him, I've got an idea actually, because I thought this has got to be a big hit. I really did think that. Uh, let's cut a lacquer, let, let, uh, an acetate and we'll send it to Decca with a, <laughs> with a different name and, and uh, see what happens, you know. So we did this, and do you know what? They turned that down too. And not many people know this, but this is what happened. <laughs> so we did it purely as a joke, you know, but uh, just to, to test it out. Yes, we just sent it to, to Decca. I don't know who heard it, who didn't hear it, but uh, we got the answer back that uh, no. Amazing. Yeah, Meant to be but that was just a, nobody knew this. I'm, I'm only telling you that because uh, uh, it was a, just as a joke. Uh, oh, well, not so much as a joke, really, to test, you know, to see uh, what we'd got. This was before uh, it it became a hit. I must say that obviously uh, we'd only just finished the mix, and I suddenly got this idea: this has got to be great. Norman, tell me, what was it like when the Beatles came into the studio after you had gotten, gotten a mix-up of what you had just recorded? Was there ever excitement over a particular song? Ah, uh, well, it, it was such a good feeling developed between us all that we were all equally as enthusiastic on the completion of a song, uh, particularly, of course, after Please Please Me, hit number one. Uh, from then on, I mean, we, as I've said, we were just like a, a family and we all got the same excitement uh, visually from the boys. I'm not too sure, I can't remember George getting that excited, but then again, he, 
you know. Uh, it's <laughs> I suppose he couldn't show it uh, like the rest of us did anyway. But uh, yeah, we were very excited about it, always. After each song, you know, I mean, it was just that enthusiasm, wow, you know, there, 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 here comes another one. That kind of feeling. Difficult to describe except, you know, how a family would feel uh, against it, its own siblings or whatever, you know, if they may get success. It's that kind of, that kind of feeling because, as I've said so many times, we were a family, no doubt about it. Uh, George Martin reckons he was the fifth Beatle, I was the sixth, but that's the, he's got it the wrong way round. I was the fifth and he was the sixth. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you feel that way? Because, as I said, I got on so well with the boys and uh, uh, I, I, I felt that uh, my input to the, to, the, uh, to the Beatles' success was just as important as anybody else's, and uh, that's why I feel that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've read this story. There was a song that you played for Paul and John around the help time. They were looking to finish the album, I think, and they liked the song a lot. Do I have it right? Yes, you do. <laughs> Can you tell me the story? <laughs> it's a sad story, actually. Um, yes, they, we were coming towards the end of the session and they needed one more song to complete the album, in actual fact. Uh, there was just the three of us in the control room, Dick, Dick James, the publisher, George Martin and myself. I did have the mics open uh, down in the studio so I could hear what they were saying. And they were going through, oh, what should we do next? And they were uh, going through, I forget the guy's name now, a big American song, rock uh, writer, American one. Um, can't think of his name now, but they were going through his uh, uh, songs and others, and, but they couldn't decide on one. I could hear all this going over. And it so happened, just like a Hollywood movie, in my inside pocket, I happened to have the song that I had just written with John Lennon in mind. I'd finished it the day before, actually, and I'd put it in my inside pocket. And I suddenly thought, my God, I wonder, should I? So anyway, there came a bit of a silence in the control room. And I, I, then I said to George, George Martin, I said, well, it so happens, I don't know whether you're going to believe this or not, but I do happen to have a, a song in my inside pocket that would, I think I've written for John Lennon. So George Martin said to me, tell him on the talkback. So, but I was like this, you know. And so I said, no, I, I can't do it. You do it. So anyway, he picks up the microphone. and I said, ask for Paul to come up. So he, he just went, Paul, can you come up? Norm's written a song. And I heard him say, have you normal? <laughs> I heard all that business, you know. So anyway, Paul came up. And um, he said, you've written this song? I said, uh, yeah, I have. He said, well, come down and sing it to us. You know, I said, no, I'm too nervous. I'll tell you what, I'll take you across into number three studio and I'll sit at the piano and play it to you. So this is what I did. Went across there, played it to him. And at the end of it, he said, that's great, Norm, that's great. He said, uh, that sounds as though John could do that. So I said, well, uh, no offence, Paul. I said, but that's who I've written it for. So he said, all oh, right, let's get John up. So anyway, he, we did, we got John up. So now there's the three of us in number three and I played it to get to John. And at the end of it, Norm, he, John said, uh, great, Norm, I, I can do that. I love to, I said, well, it is for you, John. So he said, oh, wonderful, right, okay, we'll do it. So we're back into the control room, we go. And um, they, you know, they said, no, it's great. Said to George Martin, Dick James, it's great, we're gonna do it. And, and they said to me, uh, can you do some sort of a little demo, it was a Friday evening, uh, over the weekend, because we had another session booked for the Monday, the following Monday. So I thought, well, this I'm not going to miss, somehow I will do a demo, you know. Well, at home, we hadn't got very much in the way of money, and uh, therefore all I had was a little old out-of-tune piano, not really good, so I thought, well, got to do it. So I just made it on an ordinary cassette, this demo, did them, wrote them out the top line and uh, chords, etc., and lyric, and looking forward to, uh, to, for the, to, to the Monday. But 
when Dick James heard that they were going to do it, after John and Paul had gone down back into the studio to pack up, um, Dick turned to me and he said, congratulations, Norm, that's great. He said, but I tell you what, I'll offer you £15,000 for it now to buy it outright. Well, of course, I nearly collapsed because, I mean, we, we've got nothing in the bank. So uh, I said, oh. Um, but then, looking, Dick was like where you are, and back there was George Martin behind. And so I could see, and George was sitting there going, shaking his head like that. So I thought, oh, God, I wonder why. Um, well, I'll tell you what, Dick, I said, um, wait till Monday, I'll give you the answer on Monday, because we've got another session on Monday. So he said, oh, yeah, OK, I will we'll do that. Anyway, came come Monday, and I'm sat, obviously, I got there about an hour early waiting for this session to start, thinking they're going to do my, my song. And they came in, one after the other, they all arrived together. And as they passed me to go down into the studio, I know, hello, Norm, hello, Norm. And they had a tone about their voices. I thought, uh oh, they're not very happy, it doesn't sound very good. Anyway, they went down there, and I did have a microphone open. And then it was Paul that said, No, can you hear me? So, yes, I can hear you, yeah. Can you come down? So I said, yeah, OK. So down I went into the studio. They said, oh, look, Norm, don't want you to, to be upset about it. He said, but do you realise that on this album, we only realised it over the weekend, that Ringo hadn't got a song. So I said, and I went through it in my mind, oh, that's right, yeah, no, he hasn't. So they said... Uh, you know, we know what the fans are, that they like Ringo to have a song. I said, yeah, that's true. So Paul said, well, John has written him a song over the weekend to do. So that was the one we did on Monday evening. But they said, now look, we promise you, we're going to do your song, but it'll have to wait till the next album. So I said, oh, OK then. And then you know, I didn't mind that. OK. I don't know how long it was before the next album, which was Rubber Soul, uh, start of Rubber Soul. Uh, could have been two, three, two or three months. And in that time, things had changed in a rather weird way. I don't know, it may have had something to do with the, the Indian guru and drugs, I think, came into it, etc. But as soon as we uh, started the, the first session of, of Rubber Soul, I knew things had changed. It was different. Anyway, cut a long story short, um, my song was never mentioned again, never. So something had definitely happened in that layoff between albums and was never ever mentioned again. But it was so happened that I'd only just started uh, Rubber Soul when I was asked by uh, management, would I like, because George Martin uh, uh, started his own air studios. Would I like to uh, become a producer? Well, of course, I, I jumped at it. Lovely. Yes, I would. So I told Epstein and the boys that uh, I can't see the end of, of uh, I can't go through with the end of Rubber Soul, to which they, of course, were very upset about that. And they, they uh, wanted me to stay and uh, said, to, well, uh, uh, I won't go into the, the story, but uh, they bought me a nice clock, I had a nice gold clock. They went to Bond Street and uh, uh, Asprey's, which is one of the biggest uh, jewels. And they inscribed it in the gold to me, as, as, which I've still got, of course, as a carriage clock, beautiful uh, clock. I don't know if it was some kind of softener for me to stay on to the end of <laughs> Rubber Soul or not, but of course, I mean, I was, I was delighted. And it, it was difficult for me to stay on because the, by this time I wanted to start my own collection of artists, you know, looking for artists for my... I took, it, took over the Parlophone label from George. It was, you know, difficult, but I said, OK, well, I will see the end of Rubber Soul. But it was nowhere near as enjoyable as all the previous albums had been and the previous three years I had been. I could see a great change. They weren't getting along with one another, whereby we had done an album, we did one in one day, as I've said to you, 
uh, they were all always very quick, always uh, quick, you know, to, to record. As I've said, we never did more than three takes on, on any one number. Uh, but now it was taken forever. Uh, uh, and they were arguing and uh, not a nice, well, completely un Beatles uh, happiness, you know. What were the arguments of, uh, generally about? Generally arguing about uh, what song they, uh, and how, what song they were going to do and how they were going to do it. I couldn't agree with the head arrangement. Um, perhaps the, the, the instrumentation to some degree, that kind of thing, you know, thrashing out the way it should be done. A uh, lot of criticism between them, particularly John and Paul. And I could see there was, they were definitely drifting apart. And uh, just that general feeling that it was nowhere near the same. The, the happy family uh, feeling had gone. I suppose in a way, uh, uh, the, the knowledge that I was uh, starting my own uh, production career. Uh, but I don't, it, it, I mean, I was just still as enthusiastic to start with, to see the album through. But as it went on, oh, it, no, it was nowhere near the same. And I was glad to uh, finish with it. In Rubber Soul, my, my liking for the boys never altered, faltered at all. But my enthusiasm uh, for the, the type of songs that uh, was so different, for, uh, not so enjoyable for me personally, as had been from the previous three years sort of songs. Were there ever people allowed into sessions, Norman? Only by strict appointment. Even Sir Joseph Lockwood, who was chairman of uh, EMI, he had to make appointments to come in. It was strictly... Uh, the boys in the studio, George Martin and my button pusher. And that was all in the control room. Nobody else was allowed in, nobody. Cynthia, of course, she began to uh, uh, come in fairly regularly, got on awfully well with her lovely girl. And, uh, and at that time, Jane Asher, who was uh, an actress, was knocking about with Paul developing a situation there. Lovely girl. She sat next to me as well talking, so she, they were allowed in, of course. How would you like to be remembered? <laughs> well, that's a question I haven't thought about, to be honest with you. I suppose... Uh, certainly for, for my period with the Beatles, uh, uh, some of my songs, I've written so many songs as a songwriter, uh, can't think of anything else, really. I suppose my ambitions have, have been answered. I would have liked to have perhaps, which I promised myself I was going to take over Glenn Miller's role and to uh, have my own successful big band in, uh, in the same way as he did. But apart from that, no, just for what I've, uh, I've done, you know, that's how I'd like to be remembered, that's all.